facts. Let's talk about the buses because uh, they are back in public control in Greater Manchester. Reporter Jim Connolly has been out in Manchester and Leeds talking to people about their experiences on the buses. Based, finally. Again, 44 years of neoliberal experimentation finally defeated by Andy Burnham. Do you normally catch the bus? No, I normally walk because they never turn up. Normally it says the Jew and then it always skips longer times and then sometimes it just never turns up. I had to get the bus more if they were more consistent, like turning up every single time. But half the time you go for a bus and sometimes it's like 20 minutes. First, which runs buses from this stop, told us it's been working closely with one of their technology partners to solve the issue and expect a solution very soon. Clearly the reliability of information people are getting is a big issue. Well, isn't it crazy how by having all of these different companies doing different things at different times, with all of their individual apps, all the individual tracking of each different route for each private provider, was an incredibly stupid way of trying to stratify your delivery of public transport. Isn't it crazy how you put them all under one network, all under one name, all with the same ticketing, all with the same integration, and then one single app that does everything and that makes everything easier more efficient with a better consumer experience than you would do if loads of different private companies are doing their own thing here's a story chat when i lived in salford i used to go into the city center of manchester all the times where i played magic the gathering and the bus that went from audsall which is the area that i lived in salford directly into piccadilly gardens and it was the 33 bus which was a stagecoach bus and it went every 15 minutes or every half an hour, depending on the time of the day. And that was fine. That was fine. Apart from the fact that one time I buy my stagecoach day ticket in the morning, so I'd go and play some magic, and then I'd come back in the afternoon, and suddenly the 33 bus is being run by first for some reason. This is the same bus route being run by two different private providers. So my stagecoach day ticket is now no longer valid. I'm like, there are no more stagecoach buses. This is the last 33. And then the 63 to Eccles, which is also run by first buses, is going for the rest of the night. There are no more stagecoach buses back on this route, even though I am the same bus with the same number from a different private company. Why did this allow to continue for so long? Why has this been a thing for 44 years? This is Lee in Greater Manchester, one of the first places in the region where buses are coming back into public control. You kind of connect the idea of kind of like the red London buses, so you've got the yellow Manchester buses. I think that's um, quite a nice thing to have. I think it's a good idea. Some people would argue that ultimately non-bus users are going to end up subsidising your bus journey and that's not really fair. We want a bus service, we don't want to just be the companies making loads of money out of it and only picking the routes that they want. Tell us where you're heading today. Well, exactly. That's an issue with public transport as well that privatisation really fails to be able to cover is that if your only motivator is profit, there are plenty of areas that will just get not the service that they need. That can lead to loads of inconvenience for people who necessarily rely on that kind of stuff. It's why privatisation of Royal Mail was such a failure because they have to give the same level of service delivery to Orkney, right, as they do to the centre of Manchester, which of course means that that's not overall profitable. It has to be run as a public service which makes no sense for there to be so much private involvement to the point at which as we've seen recently they've tried to rip up posties contracts to fatten the company up to sell to some private equity firm from luxembourg for my, my mother's having cataracts moved Oh, right, OK. It's an eye operation, right. Yeah. <laughs> You've had to build any extra time into your day because of the buses? We've had to come out totally. Have you? Yeah, because we don't, we don't know if buses go to turn up or not. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit, they're a bit iffy at the moment. As long as the bus turns up when I want it, anybody can, anybody <laughs> can run the service. As long as I get a bus when I want one. Would buses be better, all of them, under public control and public ownership in the way the B network is now? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because public ownership of uh, transport <laughs> is actually something that polls very well with conservative voters. It's not just a, a left-right thing. It's generally very popular. I think even I think even the mighty Grant, Grant Shapps said that he hoped that this worked. <laughs> Himself, Grant wanted it to work. So I, I think that it will be popular. The rollout of it will be popular. There is a question about this in the long term, is how it's funded, because I understand that a lot of the money to sort of get this going was from a one-off pot. So there might be a case that what Andy Burnham's done here will play out very well. It's yellow. People seem to like that. It's called the B, <laughs> the B bus. It's the branding. It's all excellent. You know, and I think there is a plan to have more devolution for local authorities to be able to do this without 
necessarily being any extra funding to facilitate that. So whether or not there will be the local funding to be able to implement bus communism throughout the country remains to be seen. Uh, but what we need to make sure is that, of course, as Greg says, that there isn't a massive withdrawal of funding from central government so that the B network fails, so that the Labour right can use that as a vehicle to be able to show you why. Well, first of all, we were correct to not roll it out. We were correct to leave it up to local councils so local councils can then say that it fails when it's been underfunded and use that as a vector to attack all public ownership with. But given how poorly strapped our local authorities are and our mayoral authorities as well, you'd think that if Labour wanted to continue winning elections, they'd want to fix that issue. Burnham, it's done, he's done it. It's been a hard thing. It's been a hard slog through the courts to, to do this. The things that he has to do down the line to fund it might be where the difficulties come. But I guess from the public's point of view, they might think that even if it does cost them a bit more in terms of business rates, council tax, they might just withstand that if it works. It, will it be better, though, uh, Damien? It's got to be better. Well, they have. It's an absolute absolute mess. I mean, you look at the number of services, the amount yeah. of different fares, the amount of different contractors. There's a lot of Wild West up there. So public ownership would be better, won't it? It might be. It might not be. We don't know. I mean, I, th I think uh, the most profound thing was... The classic answer from somebody who knows they're wrong. Everybody knows that private ownership of our transport network has just failed miserably. And he's just like, well, maybe it might be better, might not be. Who can tell? Who can possibly divine the future of publicly owned transport in this country? Even Thatcher thought, like, privatising the train was stupid. Even Thatcher thought that it was stupid. You better believe that there are plenty of wet Tories who have just consistently understood that this stuff was bound to fail, but are victims of the sunk cost fallacy with regards to continual failure of private ownership of our transport network. Said by the, the, the last lady on, on the uh, report, uh, who said, I don't care who runs it as long as the buses come, mm. which is ex right. exactly right. And, and, oh. and the previous question was also quite funny. Somebody's got to pay for it. Um, most, I mean, bus services in most of the country, they're not in, in some big cities, are privately run, but they're all quite heavily subsidised by taxpayers through mm. local uh, government. Exactly. We need to be able to use the actual money that comes into local authorities to be able to have a more functioning centre. Do you think that motorists want completely clogged up roads into central Manchester because no one uses the buses because they're not good enough? This higher and more efficient bus service and cheaper service will encourage more people into the buses so that car usage will go down, not be better for emissions in the city for everybody who lives there. It would also mean that people who do continue to drive will have less traffic to deal with as well and will be better for the environment. It's just a win-win-win for everything. And it's better for tourism as well. Most tourists will get around with public transport. If anything, if anything as a model just, just show you how much public ownership of transport is just a net benefit for everybody. Just look at London. Best transport in the country. It's in London. What does that tell you? The taxpayer's already paying for quite a lot. The taxpayer will end up presumably paying for all of it in, in Manchester. It might be better, it might not be. Well, that's the key, isn't it? It is about who's subsidising it and to the tune of how much. Well, we were told in the 80s when the Thatcher government deregulated the buses that it would be cheaper fares, more investment. And obviously what happened was the absolute opposite. Bus fares rising at double the rate of wages. But there is a problem. This is about control, not about ownership, because uh, the government has barred local government from taking ownership of buses and I think that's the next step I think you know it's a it's an important first step re-regulation well, yes I mean I think there'll be a transport cheaper. for Greater Manchester won't You've noticed that since one of the three lanes going into and out of Manchester has become a dedicated bus lane, it's become a lot easier and less congested driving into Manchester city centre when I have needed to drive there. 100%. Like, people would think, oh, you're taking away a lane. That's going to make the traffic worse. And, of course, induced demand works in reverse as well. Induced demand not only will mean more demand when you increase the number of lanes, it also will reduce the demand if you reduce the number of lanes as well. And as what you're replacing it with is a lane of people travelling by a more kind of mass transportation, which will in general free up more people out of their cars, that leads to a more efficient travel for everybody. Because again, when we think about the cost that's being paid for these things, we talk about, oh, this is taxpayer funded. We forget about any of the positive externalities of engaging in this stuff, rather than just saying, oh, well, why should I pay into the NHS if I'm not using it? Because the society is better for having the NHS for you. You will gain from the economic growth of there always being a healthy population by people having access to the NHS. You will benefit by ensuring that your family members and your friends are less likely to be dealing with sky-high bills from a private 
hospital, for example, in the same way that even if you're not a bus user, because buses are such a net benefit in externality terms for the city that you live in, for the people that you're around, for the quality of the air that you breathe, for indeed the quality of your drive to that same place, if you are a motorist, it, it shows you why taxation to spend on these things is worth it. Even if under an individualist, neoliberal kind of brain rot society, you believe that every single penny that gets spent has to benefit you specifically, so much so that you'll block anything if it doesn't narrowly fit into what you particularly want in direct terms. There are so many other positive things that you'll get out of that down the line that you don't really notice. Under like the neoliberal brain rot of individualism, you will go against the greater good and also your own personal interest in the long term because you're only interested in the short term. Dare I say, because you're only interested in sticking plaster politics. Bingo. Yeah, in, in the and way there is in London, and um, I think you would like full public ownership. Well, I, I think that should be on the table oh, because okay. at the moment money's being taken out of the system into profits that could be used for investment in more electric buses and cheaper fares. So, you know, let's let's be even more ambitious and Labour is committed to getting rid of that rule that prevents local government owning. Damien, would that you know, be a good it, idea? It's a question of, of where you get the capital from, the, you know, the big sums that you need. I mean, buses are obviously less capital intensive, capital mm. demanding than railways, and but you still, Scotland, you still need to buy buses. new buses and if you're saying we're going to eliminate all private sector money, then that means all that capital has got to come from taxpayers as well. And they they may start objecting to that. It's true. Once all the private companies aren't serving their buses in the local area, all those buses will just disappear. They'll disappear forever. No one will ever be able to use those buses once the private companies have their franchise agreements taken away. The case of being run better, but also that the fares would be cheaper, Ava, because actually a single bus fare on the B network, this network in Greater Manchester, is £2. A London single bus fare is £1.75, and the government's capped the bus fares outside of London at two, £2 until the end of October. Shouldn't it be even cheaper? Yeah, I mean, well, outside London, about 40% of the bus revenue is public money. So that's 60%. A lot of that has got to go to profit as well. If you can eliminate that profit margin in there, then yes, you can bring the bus fares down. I just think we should... Nat and not just profit as well. You'll be paying off consultancies. You'll be paying off CEOs. You'll be paying off directorial boards, for example. You look at, for a public company, the difference between the top wage and the bottom wage is much smaller. More of the money will either be going back into the service because there is no profit, there are no shareholders, there are no dividends, that money will go back into providing a better service and the rest of that money will go into having better remunerated overall staff as well, which is much better as far as I'm concerned than having a, the private kind of shareholder capitalist model with regards to delivery of a public service like transport that everyone really and truly needs or at least lots of people need. And we'll need more as people come out of their cars over time. Nationalise the entire network and I think it would be a really good thing for Labour to get behind. I mean, it's funny at the moment, there's, there's never been... And that's why I disagreed with Lou Haig when I was beefing on Twitter. When they say, oh, more local authorities will be able to do this. And whilst I think that there's room for localism overall in the discussion that we have around policy in this country, I think leaving it up to individual local councils to try means that automatically it means that more cities will do this and more rural areas won't. Which means that there are people in rural areas who need to use public transport and they'll never get the investment in it because they're in a tiny minority, especially if their rural constituencies are richer and lots of people drive. But if you can't drive, if you're in these constituencies and you can't afford to drive, your local authority will never pander to you. Which is why I think that on top of the fact that, you know, unless they have the actual central government capital to invest into this public ownership model, a lot of it times it won't even get off the ground. Like, under under Labour's plans of giving local authorities the ability to do this, right? Mayors already can do this, hence why Andy Burnham is doing this now. And why is it that only Steve Rotherham and Andy Burnham have done this? There are another five other Labour metro mayors. None of them have done this yet. So this idea that Labour can just expand that to local authorities and expect it to happen, when it's not even happened under their own watch currently under mayoralties they have control over, doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. When a proper way of doing this in my mind would just be do it nationally. Have fully integrated transport. There's no reason why your ticket that you buy for a train in one place can't be used for a bus in another place or to go on a tram or something else when we could just properly integrate and everyone could get anywhere through the same ticketing system. We could have everything under one app. It can all be in like the national transport directory. Properly integrated for every part of the country would be much better than the way we have it now. More support for like solid left-wing policies. It's not where I am politically <laughs> but you can see that the support's there and in every respect Starmer 
administration seems to be tiptoeing away from mm. these things. Yeah. Things that have big support, things that he actually committed to three years ago. I find it odd well, politically. Labour's committed to allowing local government to own. I think that's a big step forward. I think it'll take time. But yeah, again, as I said, mayoral teams can already do this and Labour ones haven't done it. Why? And local governments already have very little money as well. To roll out, but it's got to be better value for money for customers and also having an integrated approach. The other good thing that Andy Burnham is doing is, is integrating the buses with trams, with rail. That will make a big difference to productivity and the economy in Greater Manchester. That's a good thing for all and of us. And you've talked about public... And again, this should be done everywhere with the full integration across all transport networks under the DFT. If it's all different local networks, we still run into this problem, not as much as we have now, but you still run into the same problem of, of making integration harder because they're all their individual little schemes, right? And I can get that working on a localism level if you look at like the Preston model for local businesses. But when it comes to such a massive national project like transport, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Public ownership, but has Labour, is Labour under Keir Starmer tiptoeing away um... Um, as has just been said, away from nationalising other uh, vital industries. There's been an uh, absolute clear commitment to bringing back the railways. As those franchises come up, they'll come back into uh, public control. There's also a commitment to British energy, which again... But no, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. GB Energy is not nationalising the energy sector. There's a billion of that 28 billion being put forward for like local energy projects, which, I, again, I've already been on record as thinking is a good idea. The 27 other billion of that is earmarked for public-private partnerships. So it's not even national ownership. It's some level of share dividends for the state rather than actually publicly owned energy. And even then, you're still competing with all the other private energy generators. And the national grid is staying privatised and all of the retailers are staying private privatised as well. You're not even going to have a state provider to compete with them. And with the rail, rail nationalisation, Labour aren't even committing to buying back the rolling stock or even replacing the rolling stock over time. We're still going to be paying out huge amounts of money in train rent every year to Alliance and KKR, like private equity firms in other countries who own our rolling stock. That is such an apocalyptically stupid system. And loads of our trains need revamping anyway. Just put capital investment into new rolling stock upgrade the trains to be better, as well as getting Alliance and KKR to not have their hands in the trough. And I think is a big first step because, you know, people aren't stupid. We can see that we've all been ripped off and robbed by water privatisation, energy privatisation and rail privatisation. Labour are nowhere near water nationalisation. In fact, as we mentioned before, Will Hutton has been colluding with Seven Trent to ensure they have a plan for a way of making sure that nationalisation doesn't happen ever. I guess clearly she's forgotten her position as someone from the trade union movement and not indeed a Labour grandee, even though... Just been given a peerage and suddenly she has no criticisms of Labour anymore. It's, it won't happen overnight in my view. I'm a pragmatic person but what you need to do is be clear about the direction of travel. Damien? I, I think um, it, it may be um, an age thing but anyone who can remember the nationalised industries and the nationalised oh, transport the that we used wars. to have uh, will remember that British Rail was a national joke, that we were very bad at most of the other things we did. It's and the idea, on you know, people on the whole hold government in some contempt. The idea that the government should not only do what it does now, but should do a lot more and should run the commanding well, heights of the economy. TfL doesn't Rail is nationalised and that goes right outside of London and that's one of the best rail networks that we have in the country. I mean, um, at the moment, if you want to get on a train outside of a strike day, I'm not including strike days, it's likely going to be a rail replacement bus or it's going to be so overcrowded that you can't sit down so no, privatization and the idea, right, that the better comparison on public versus private ownership is comparing what we have now to what was in the 1970s, different technology, different time period, different straight on the network, rather than comparing outside of London with London when, you know, it's just like a gigantic night and day difference between getting public transport in London and anywhere else in the country, like night and day difference in how much better London is. Another point of contact on this one as well is that not only is the train service worse and more expensive under privatisation, but it's more dangerous as well. You remember Potter's Bar, the Potter's Bar rail crash? That was literally caused due to underfunding in National Rail to be able to maintain maintenance within the Potter's Bar area on that track. It was under-maintained because of privatisation. If, for example, they got the reduction in maintenance within the deal they were trying to push through with the RMT from National Rail, things like Potter's Bar would have happened more often. It's not really yeah, working I either. Don't, I don't think arguing that Tory ministers are useless is a great platform 
platform for saying we can't bring I'm, I'm back I'm saying public the state ownership. is useless at running commercial activities. I, I think what Burnham might have happened upon here is quite a workable model in my view, is that you have some sort of private enterprise involved in that. A reasonable compromise between two things. I'd certainly, I'd certainly be cautious about complete kind of nationalisation of, of, of all trends. But would you like to see other parts of the country? I mean, regional mayors in places like Leeds and West Yorkshire mm. and Liverpool City Region have indicated they want to do the same. I think it makes sense. happened in Manchester. Yeah, I think it might. Well, listen, a lot of it will depend on how successful this is. And then will people still feel the same way if in three years, you know, there's an expensive congestion charge in Manchester or some other long term funding solution? Because Burnham said that ULEZ wouldn't work because over time ULEZ yeah. would be projected to disappear as the air gets cleaner. So I don't think he's yet solved how it'll be funded yet. Right. I mean, in terms of more money going into bus services generally, £300 million has been committed to save bus routes and that will then encourage more people back onto the buses if the fares come down. Is that a good use of money? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, if, if people you know, want to travel on buses, then you need the buses there for them to do so. So I think that is uh, a good use of money, uh, and and that and is a good. Should it be more? Should it be question. doubled that pot of money? Well, uh, yeah, we're, we're now back into yeah. What do we want? Everything? When do we want it now? That you know, well, you can always you can always say the government should spend more money. It's our money they're always spending, and and this is the point we've we've had a bit of discussion about how, how you know, profit being used as a boo word. The, the, the reason. What, what you get if private companies make profits is that they can then generate the capital to make the big spending that other... I'm going insane. This is literally just like the factually incorrect. Factually incorrect. Look at the water companies. This is the obvious answer of everything that Baldy here is saying. Completely, completely false. Just completely false. How much of the profit from the water companies ever, ever, ever got reinvested back into developing a better service hmm? in this natural monopoly. Do you want to detail to me anywhere in which any of that money got reinvested back in rather than being sent off into the pockets of shareholders, into banks in the Cayman Islands, or indeed used as collateral to be able to take on more loans to pay out more dividends? Like we have the evidence in front of our eyes, Damien. We're not stupid. Otherwise, would have to come directly out of taxpayers' pockets. It's a, a lesson that we are in danger of forgetting. It's, it's capital investment, Damien. It can come from fiscal expansion. That's what the fiscal expansion is there for. It's there for capital investment. Oh, my God. These Tories, they drive me insane. The private network that was running Northern Rail was still using pacer trains in 2020. This is why it's got its franchise taken away from it, because its network was so poor because of lack of reinvestment. Getting in this country. You're looking sceptical, Ava. Well, I don't know. The Caledonian Sleeper just got renationalised, and people are pretty happy with that. And if you look round to the home counties, I can mainly speak to the home um, counties in London, because that's where I live. I do apologise. But, you know, if you look at South Western <laughs> Railway, they were turning over hundreds of millions of pounds worth of profits. For some reason, in the last couple of years, they've upped their fares and and they've taken certain services out of action. Why are you continuing to make profit, but also reducing the service? I mean, the, re the reason why some services have gone is, is straightforwardly that the uh, use, passenger usage post-pandemic has only got back to about 80%. The lines got cut because they weren't profitable for the private companies. So people in those areas who relied on those services now get lower utility from the service that's provided. Because why would a private company do anything in the sake of utility when they could be making things for profit? Like you're disproving your own argument, Damien. Of, of its previous level. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a reaction to a market. That service still needs to run for people to use, you know, for productivity. So at the moment, people are at home going, well, I don't know if I should go into the office because I'm not sure if I can get a train in or a train back. If there was a nationalised service that guaranteed that it was going to get you there, they might get on the train. But why, why would a nationalised service necessarily be, be better? The idea that just because the government runs something, it will be better and more reliable. Well, Japan Slice Just as a natural monopoly, you clown, you moron. You understand basic market dynamics, Damien. You literally were in government. You're supposed to understand how markets work. I'm a communist. I don't even like markets. And even I know how they work better than you do. Do Flies in the face of all Germany, evidence. Yeah. All sorts of, I do, know, do think that post-Covid there is, seems to be a greater appetite for let the state get involved. And I wonder if that speaks to the idea that mm. overall, certainly the perception was that we did badly at the beginning of the pandemic, but overall maybe that people think that they were OK with a lot of the interventions. So there's, it's almost like a, a long mm. Covid symptom politically where the answer to a lot of things is, 
more state involvement. I, I'm, well, I think in, in this case, I think... This is why no one gets the train in Germany and why it's far more expensive than it is here and why Deutsche Bahn is continually nationalised and that why there's so many calls to, to, to privatise it. That's definitely a thing that happens. God, it's, it's crazy, like, watching these people just rewrite existence in front of your eyes. Like, look at the European countries. Like, so many of them have nationalised models and they're infinitely, infinitely better run than ours are. And for a long time, other countries owned with their nationalised rail companies owned our railways. So Arriva, who ran Arriva Trains Wales and ran Northern Rail before it got its franchise taken away, is owned by Deutsche Bahn, who is the government in of Germany's nationalised rail service. Before Abelio had their franchise taken away on the East Anglia line, that's run by the Danish government. We are literally subsidising German railways. We subsidise uh, Norwegian healthcare and Norwegian pensions. Every other country just has their snouts in the f***ing UK trough because of the gigantic failure of conservative policy on the economy. More state involvement, but not complete. Our former uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson was quite keen on uh, big state projects and state involvement, wasn't he? Yeah, well, there's a difference between projects where, where you build something and day-to-day and -day state involvement running running services that i mean clearly some things have to have i mean to what guarantee the is there though that the, the state can run it and will run it better i think you need to take a strategic approach i think you need to be clear about where the market is not working for ordinary people so in the 80s we had these bus wars i don't know if you remember <coughs> Damien, where a lot of buses said well i just want to cherry pick the most lucrative routes and we've seen that played out over lots of other modes of transport too. So you need to figure out where will it make a difference to our economy, where is it an essential part of the infrastructure for our economy to grow and green, and then it is worth taking that into public ownership and control. Right, well, let's take it. Is it a national monopoly? Yes, should be publicly owned. Simple. Done. To your constituency, because I understand there have been cuts in your constituency in Ashford in terms of the services, bus services being run. Who would you like to run them? Uh, I don't think they'd, they'd be, be any better run you don't? Uh, if they were run by someone else. I mean, that, and, and the services, and we've thought to save some of them necessarily, and succeeded that actually a combination of Kent County Council and Stagecoach, who are the main bus company, uh, in Kent have actually uh, removed some of those cuts. But I think that the, the, the Sorry, general... but with all due respect, you're saying that there were services cut, but you don't think anyone else could run the cut services better? <laughs> well, uh, not without paying more. <laughs> it, 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 it Got him! Got him! Let's come down to this, and, and the point um, that Francis has just made about, about the state running it is that there are always priorities, and if you get something like you know, a health service backlog and you have ministers deciding, if you have a nationalised industry saying, are we going to spend that extra hundred million on the health service or bus services? I can tell you now that bus services would start becoming threadbare and not subsidised. you can make choices. But then if the health service was getting a hundred million pounds and it was a privately owned trust, knowing that they have a carte blanche to do whatever they want with that money because they have a state contract and therefore only to provide the basic level of service that doesn't have that contract revoked, they will look at that hundred million pounds and go, how about we give this out to our shareholders rather than reinvest in capital investment, which hasn't happened for 13 years, I mean, longer than that since PFIs and since trusts got sold off to places like Centene and Virgin Care, They've not been reinvesting in capital investment. Why would they, when their shareholders' dividends is what their fiduciary responsibility is there for? Can't you? But you um, have to make and choices. Tax cuts what we're saying. For the rich, to me, is not a priority. Investing in no, our buses. No, nobody's which talked is about every, tax cuts every, for the rich. Every, that's, every, well, that's just a piece a of rhetoric. Of you, a lot of. Well, you literally are planning a tax cut for the richest people in society in the form of an inheritance tax cut. Lots of Conservative MPs are saying precisely that, that All they right. want to see more corporate welfare and more tax cuts for the rich. But I'm so glad that Andy Burnham is bringing bus communism. And my God, if you were somebody who had like an ambivalent view on public ownership before watching that panel, watching Damien Green stumble to make any arguments and inadvertently making the case against private ownership by being so dumb, you must immediately have just thought that things should be publicly owned, right? No one who's a fence sitter on that got convinced by Damien Green other than to believe that maybe privatisation is incredibly stupid, because it is. It's incredible how these people get allowed into government and they can't even argue their own positions correctly. What must he have been like in the House of Commons or in the House of Lords? Jesus. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider liking and subscribing. It does help out the channel and the algorithm. And if you click the bell notification icon, it will let you know when I go live and when I upload videos.
If you'd like to follow me on social media, my handle is at NoJusticeMTG, and that is Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube. If you want to support my channel in a more financial manner, you can do so by becoming a member for just 99p, by super chatting, or by supporting me on Patreon, with the link is in the description of this video, and hopefully I'll catch you on the next segment.